Matthew chapter 14. Unintentionally, I don't even know if it qualifies as a series. I, I think probably every uh, message would probably fit into this category of discussing disciples, what it means to be a follower, a, a student uh, of Christ, model our life um, after Him. And uh, in the last few weeks, we've talked about the uh, disciples' directive. Uh, very simple, make more disciples. Uh, that's it. Uh, we often emphasize the word go. Uh, that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is make disciples. That's our task. That's who we are to be. Make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. We do that. Uh, I think Paul teaches, in, as we looked in Colossians, uh, our duty is to look like Christ. Um, and to have those characteristics uh, about us. Uh, today I want to look um, at, I think, the dilemma. Uh, it's difficult to be a disciple. Uh, it, it's hard to be a disciple. It's not too hard this morning. Uh, we're sitting here in church. It's not too difficult to sit here uh, and be a disciple. We all look like disciples. We all, uh, you know, we just, uh, it's not that difficult to look like a follower of Christ today. Uh, but tomorrow when the water heater busts, tomorrow when uh, you've got to go to the doctor, tomorrow uh, when, um, you know, when uh, the kids are acting crazy, uh, sometimes it can be difficult to be uh, a, a disciple, a follower, a student uh, of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it is challenging. Uh, and so this morning I want us to look at the story uh, of the disciples themselves as they are uh, looking at Christ. You know the story there on, the, uh, on Galilee, they're uh, in the boat. Uh, when the storm starts to, to rage, the winds start to blow, and they are being tossed about, and Jesus comes uh, walking out on the water, and Peter asks for permission to go to him. Um, and, uh, and, and so he starts to walk. He takes his eyes off of Christ. He begins to go under, and Christ, they end up in the boat. So uh, pretty straightforward story that uh, most of us know. Uh, I think it's important to notice when you think about that story for a moment, um, just how bad a storm that has to be, uh, how bad a storm that was uh, that Peter decided, an experienced fisherman, experienced sailor, uh, decided that given the option in this storm of staying in the boat or getting out of the boat, I will choose to get out of the boat. Now, that's a storm. Now, I don't know if you've ever been on, been on the water, uh, been out when the water's got rough, but um, uh, been in a few storms like that, been tossed around, probably not to that magnitude, but been tossed around uh, to the point where I was uh, sufficiently concerned. Uh, I've been uh, tossed around to the point, uh, I may not look like it, but um, fairly uh, pretty, pretty, pretty decent uh, swimmer, uh, and I've been tossed around to the point that I was kind of looking around, deciding uh, where was the closest shore uh, and uh, what was the path of least resistance, but I've never been in a storm so bad uh, that given the choice, uh, I would choose to get out of the boat. Uh, you know, I, I may be thinking, what am I going to do if the boat goes without me? Uh, but I've never thought ever about, uh, I'm going to get out and leave the boat here. Uh, I just never quite had uh, that kind of experience. That had to be a storm. Uh, that, that had to be a terrifying storm uh, that an experienced sailor uh, would choose to willingly uh, leave behind uh, his vessel. Uh, I, I just can't imagine what kind of storm uh, it would take to, to bring a person to that point. You know, given the choice of staying here in the boat or getting in, I'm going to take my chances getting in. Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a storm. Uh, and, and out of this story, I think there are five questions uh, that we need to answer, uh, not yearly, not even monthly, but uh, probably daily and sometimes maybe even hourly, uh, that we need to be constantly measuring and uh, evaluating our, our walk with Christ. What kind of disciple we are, uh, how are we following Christ, I, I believe uh, these five questions can really help us to, uh, to understand uh, where we are. I think they help us to, uh, to deal with uh, the, the dilemmas in our life, uh, when uh, storms rage, when things don't 
don't go the way that uh, perhaps we think they should, uh, that uh, things are, are not going correctly uh, in our mind. Um, you know, when we find ourselves uh, like these disciples in the middle of the ocean and the wind blowing, uh, I think these five questions can help us uh, to navigate those kind of circumstances and situations, but uh, I, I think they can also, uh, if we're careful with these five questions, can in many times keep us out uh, of those kinds of situations and those kind of storms. And so uh, this morning as we look through this story, I think, again, there are uh, five questions that uh, we're going uh, to come across based on this story. Uh, I think, uh, as I think about them, I think about uh, how God told the Israelites to take the Word of God and hang it around their neck and write it over their doorpost. That would uh, that'd kind of be my prayer for these five questions as we hang them around our neck. Uh, that we write them over our doorposts. We think about them uh, daily uh, in, uh, in our decision-making processes. We interact uh, with others. H- how, we are, uh, how these five questions uh, should be answered. I can tell you uh, that, that uh, they're, they're pretty straightforward, uh, but they may not be pleasant. To begin with, uh, as we noticed in this text, uh, Jesus has been ministering. Um, <clears throat> And he directs the disciples uh, to get in the ship and go to the other side. And, and, and he tells them, I'm going to disperse to the crowd. Uh, you go ahead and, and, and you go over to the other side and, and I'll catch up with you later. Uh, and the Bible actually uses the word uh, there. It says that Jesus constrained them uh, to get in the ship. Now, I, I don't know how often you have ever been constrained uh, or you have constrained someone. That's a pretty uh, strong word. Uh, Jesus doesn't suggest they get in the ship. Uh, he doesn't recommend they get in the ship. Uh, the, the word there, the idea, uh, is uh, almost the, the idea of get in the ship. Uh, you, know, that's, uh, you know, that's the idea uh, of being constrained. If you've ever uh, taken a small child and put them in a, uh, in a car seat, uh, sometimes you know they don't want to go, uh, and uh, you know sometimes it's not the easiest thing in the world. Uh, it's kind of like herding cats. It's uh, a little bit difficult sometimes, and you you know you stand there, you you know you're holding up one foot, and you're you know you're wrestling them, and you know here I hold them, you buckle them, you know uh, that kind of thing. You know it's a uh, you know it's a real chore sometimes to get them in there, but they got to be there. It's the law, so we we constrain them. That's kind of the idea of the word. Jesus puts them on this ship, and so sends them to the other side, but midway across, the storm blows up. And so I think uh, that begs the very first question we need to ask ourselves is, when uh, am I where God wants me to be? Uh, That is a dynamic question uh, for evaluating our our Christian walk, for evaluating uh, our role as a disciple uh, of Jesus Christ. Am I where God wants me to be? Am I, am I doing the things that, uh, that he wants me to do? Uh, these dis- disciples, we, uh, we notice, they are in the ship because Christ puts them in the ship and tells them to go to the other side. And, and midways across, uh, they run into this storm. Now, I, I think there's two aspects to this question uh, that we need to be thinking about. One of them is, uh, is daily. Perhaps almost moment by moment, we need to be asking ourselves, am I where God wants me to be? Not almost, uh, not on my way, not I used to be, but am I where God wants me to be? Am I, am I working where God wants me to work? Am I, uh, am I dealing with the people God wants me uh, to interact with? Am I, uh, am I representing Him as He would, uh, as he would uh, have me to be? Uh, and so it's important, I think, for us to ask ourselves that question regularly. Uh, this is not a... Uh, like your annual physical or once a year question. This is uh, almost step-by-step question. Am I where God wants me to be? Uh, I am slowly kind of adjusting.
adjusting uh, to, to age, uh, and uh, I am, uh, I, I'm getting to the point uh, where I am uh, one of the, the, the longer-serving, older uh, pastors in town. There's only a couple uh, that, that have been around here uh, longer than I have, and so, uh, you know, some of the younger ones, uh, they, they'll ask me questions and, uh, about things, and, and, and one in particular um, I, I can think of on several occasions has, um, and, 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 you know, God bless him. He's in a, uh, you know, uh, I, I, God bless him is the, the, the mildest thing I can say considering the situation he's in. Uh, you know, it's it, it, a barrel of monkeys is what that place is. And, uh, and, and I don't blame him, but occasionally he'll, uh, you know, he'll come up and, well, I, you know, I, I'm thinking about, you know, is there, any, is there any churches looking for preachers? I, I'm thinking about putting my name in. And then he talks about, uh, you know, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I'm going to go start a church. I mean, he's, you know, he, he, and, you know I got to be honest with you. If I, I'm, I'm not criticizing him. I might be, in a, I, I'm pretty sure I'd probably be in the same boat. Uh, you know, uh, I'd be helping pack. You know, uh, it, it, it's a mess. But, but I keep asking him. I, you know, every time we have this conversation, the question is this. Did God call you to be the pastor of that church? Well, yeah, yeah, I'm sure of that. Has he told you it's time to leave? Has he called you to another church? Has he called you to start a church? Has he called you to go get a job? Has he called you to make a change? Has he told you to make a change? Well, no. Then there's your answer. He called you there, be there. Bloom where you planted. If God calls you there, see, I am thoroughly and 100% convinced of this fact, that the disciples were better off in the ship, in the sea, in the storm, in the will of God than they would have been on dry land out of the will of God. That, that's my conviction. I believe with all my heart you would be better off in the deepest, darkest jungles or the deepest, darkest spot on the face of this earth in the will of God than to be in the best hospital on all the earth out of the will of God. And so we need to constantly be asking ourselves, am I where God wants me to be? Am I aware? Am I doing what God wants me to do? And if God called you there, I believe there is a reason for that. If God sent you there, whether, whether it's in your home, your job, your family, your neighborhood, uh, whatever it is, if God has you teaching a class, if God has you in a position of leadership, and God puts you there, and God has not released you from that, then boom, where you're planted, you are better off in the storm in the will of God than you are to be anywhere else out of the will of God. The other aspect of that question for the disciples was this. As they looked around and they questioned what in the world was going on, this was the memory they needed to keep in mind. We are where God told us to be. That's the beauty of that question, that when the winds blow and the storm rages, those disciples could say this, but we're where God wants us to be. I don't understand it. I don't like it. I wish it was calm. I wish the sails were full and blowing us in the right direction, but for whatever reason, they're not. But we are where God, where Christ told us to be. And so that, that's the beauty of that question we ask ourselves when we're dealing with the adversity and the problems of life. Uh, we need to ask ourselves, am I where God wants me to be? We need to ask ourselves that dealing with the good things. Am I where God wants me to be? A am I doing what God wants me to do? Is God leading me here? Is God speaking to me? Is He keeping me here? A and perhaps, yeah, listen, we see clearly from this story that sometimes when you're in the storms and the problems of life that God is in that storm. Sometimes you may answer that question when you ask that question, am I where God wants me to be? And if the answer is no, maybe that's why you're in the storm. God's trying to blow you back to where you belong. And so it, 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 that question is one that, that a, a disciple of Christ needs to be wrestling with, needs to be dealing with constantly. Again, not once a year, not once a month, but daily, every day. When we look at our plans, when we think about what we're going to do today, we think about where we've got to go. Is this where God, am I going where God, am I doing what God wants me to do? A am I saying what God, that, that should be the, the, the driving force uh, of everything we do as a disciple of Christ. Is this? 
this what Christ wants me to be? That's what a disciple is. A disciple is one who is modeling their life, patterning their life after Christ. Is this what Christ would do in this situation? That, however you choose to ask that question, I think it's a question that is, is valid and imperative in, in the believer's life that we routinely evaluate our location. One, one of the things I've shared with you before, those, those maps in the mall, you know, when, when you're trying to find a location in the mall, it's critical to have that one dot there that says, you are here. Because if you don't know where you are, you'll never find where you're going. Yeah, I, I promise you, I, I, I've seen that dot get moved. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I don't know how, uh, but I've seen that dot get moved. Yeah, and when you move that dot that says you are here, you'll see some confused looks on people's face when they're trying to get to the ice cream store and it says they're in front of the Chick-fil-A and they're looking around going, I don't see no Chick-fil-A. Yeah, I don't know which way to go. Yeah, or just take the dot off altogether. You know, whatever. Listen, you've got to know where you are. And so constantly as disciples, we need to be asking ourselves, where I am, is that where God wants me? And so that's the first question we have to ask ourselves. Am I where God wants me to be? Second question we have to ask, and I'm sure that that question was being asked by the disciples, and many of you have asked that same question. Am I forgetting God's love for me? I, I don't know. The Bible doesn't record it, but I've got to think that those disciples, having been constrained to get in the ship, and then ending up in a storm that was so severe that it would cause an experienced sailor to say, I'd rather get out than stay in the boat. Somewhere along the way had to go, well, why in the world did Jesus put us in that boat? Yeah, I got to tell you, y'all may have more faith than me. I'd ask that question. Yeah, Jesus put us in this boat, and he sent us out here. Why? Yeah. Now, y'all may sit there and be all holy and righteous and think, oh, I'd never do something like that. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I don't believe you. Yeah, uh, listen, you know, but sometimes don't we do that? You know, it's kind of the cartoon character. You know, you remember the old cartoons that had the, you know, the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other saying, go do it, and the other ones say, don't, you know, that kind of thing. Well, I, I think sometimes we're, we're kind of that way. We have, you know, those competing voices. You know, one voice saying, God doesn't love you. If he did love you, you wouldn't be in this mess. And one voice saying, he does love you. You know, which one do we listen to? You know, here these guys are. They're out there. They're out there, and, and, and they're rowing, and they're being tossed around. And, and, and again, so badly that, that Peter says, you know what? I'd rather get out of the boat. You know, I'd rather get out of the boat. I'd rather leave it, take my chances walking home. You know, that's, you know, I, listen, I've got so far three children that I've had to go through the learning to drive process. Some of you can identify with what I'm about to say. On occasion, I thought I'd rather walk. Been there? Yeah, listen, I got... A daughter-in-law that's been driving for several years. She drove me one time about five miles down the road. I got out and kissed the ground. <laughs> Y'all think I'm kidding. That girl will scare you to death. She'll never wear out a whole set of tires because her car's never on all four wheels. <laughs> now the brakes may go because if this was a stop sign, she'd still be doing 50. You know, just, uh, I, you know, when you get done riding with her, the front of your head's got a red spot and the back of your head's got a knot because you've been off the windshield, and then when she goes, she slams you backwards off the back window. You know, it, it's, a, you know, it, it's an experience. You know, it, it, I guarantee you it's good for your spiritual walk. You'll pray a lot. You know, I've never been in a ship where I said, I want, that's scary. I just got to think there was a moment in there where they questioned. Why did Jesus put us on this boat? Why did he send us out here? Ever been there? Where you question, does God really care? Is God paying attention to what's going on in my life? Is he really, is he really looking? Has he gotten so busy keeping the stars shining and the planets in orbit that he's forgot about little old me? 
It makes it tough to be a disciple sometimes when the circumstances and the situations of life cause us to wonder if he really cares. Have I forgotten that God loves me? Have I forgotten he loves me? It makes it tough to be a disciple. Am I where God wants me to be? Have I forgotten God loves me? Third question the disciple needs to regularly ask themselves: Am I practicing prayer regularly? Now we had a discussion after the first service and came up with some possible answers. Um, don't have a real answer because the Bible doesn't tell us. So anything we say is speculation. But it strikes me, and this is my sermon, y'all can preach next week, Strikes me just a little odd that there's 12 disciples on this boat. And I'm pretty sure the back end of the boat was sinking just like the front end. I don't think one end of that boat was in good weather and one end was in bad. I think the whole boat was sinking. I think all of them were afraid. But it strikes me that only Peter cries out. Now, I, I, again, I, I may be reading way too much into that. I know, as you know, if you've read the Gospels, uh, Peter was one of these guys. You, you, one thing that no one ever looked at Peter and said was, Peter, what you thinking? Because you didn't have to wonder what he was thinking. Because if it, you know, based, based on what we learn about him in Scripture, if he thought it, he said it. It, you know, it ping, ping, ping two or three times, and poof, right out it came. You, you probably know some people like that. Uh, you know, the phrase I use for them is they don't have any filters. You know, it, it, you know, most of us have thoughts run through our mind, and we go, no, I better not say that. You know, some people don't have that filter in their head. You know, it just, boom, you know, it's just out there. You know, Peter was one of those guys. And so I know Peter was kind of the spokesperson. Peter was kind of the mouthy one of the bunch. But I got to tell you, I don't care how, how loud you are and how loud you dominate the conversation. If the ship's sinking, I'm yelling help. I don't care how much you're yelling, I'm yelling help. Yeah, but, but let's be honest. The question I have here is, what were the other 11 doing? You know, everyone wants to get on. And again, I don't want to throw them under the bus because I don't know the answer to that question. I'm just pointing out that we don't see anything of the others. When, when, you know, everybody criticizes Peter for taking his eyes off of Christ and sinking, but listen, he got out of the boat. You know, he, he went to Jesus. That's more than, more than the other 11 did. Can I, can I submit to you that one of the reasons that many times we find ourselves outside of where God wants us to be, we forget that God loves us, is because we're not spending time regularly in prayer. We're, we're not talking to Him on a regular basis. You're like me. I've heard all my life that absence makes the heart grow fonder. Wh whoever said that been dropped on his head. Just that simple. Absence makes the heart wander. Now, I don't care what you say. Absence makes the heart wonder. That's just the truth. You know, it, it, it does. You, you, and so it's important if we're going to be a follower. I, 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 I can't be a student. I can't be a follower. I can't model my life after someone that I don't talk to. How else am I going to know them? How else am I going to know what they're about? How else am I going to know what they like, what they don't like? You know, and, and so one of the questions as a follower, someone trying to model their life after Christ, is we need to look at our prayer life and say, what's my prayer life looking like? Am I crying out to Jesus? And, and I, I, I like that phrase, crying out. I, I heard Richard Blackaby this week, and he, he made a point. You know, uh, he said a lot of good stuff, but one thing he said that's really uh, stuck in my head uh, was he made the statement, he said, there is a difference in praying and crying out. There is a huge difference in praying and crying out. And he said, I think part of the problem in, in, in the church of Jesus Christ in, in, in America today is we've quit crying out. You know, you, you, you know what prayer sounds like. We pray at church. Dear Lordest, Godest, in heavenest, thouest of allest, thy merciest. You know, them King James prayers where every word ends in ist or thith. You know, those kind of prayers. 
knows are good. Listen, you got they, these things you need to pray for at home. We don't need to hear about here. Just so we all understand that, you know, that there, there's things you need to talk to God about that I don't need to be in on. Yeah, you know, certainly, you know, everybody here doesn't need to know all about some of that stuff. You just, you know, just leave it alone. You know, just just take that home and you pray for that at home. But as I told you before, Dr. Henderson says the problem with our prayers for most of us is we learn to pray at church. There's a difference in praying and crying. Go through the Bible. I'll give you a little homework. Flip through the Bible this week and just see the places where people are, are crying out to God. I want to tell you, there's a difference in, in, in praying and crying out. You stand beside the hospital bed of a, of a loved one or your spouse, you'll cry out. There won't be none of this, dear Lordest, in this heavenest, in your holiest, seedest, thouest, artist, the most merciest. You know, won't be none of that. You'll get serious. You'll cry out. You'll talk to God. You get some bad news about one of your children. You find out the factory's closing. You find out uh, that, you know, you, you get your bank statement sometimes. You'll cry out. There'll be none of this, you know, recited by memory, you know, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray my, Lord, my soul to keep. Won't be none of that mess. It'll get serious. Where's our prayer life? We're going to be a disciple of Christ. We're going to be a follower of Christ. Listen, I want to tell you something that I think is extremely important. On the numerous occasions that we see Jesus Christ go off in the wilderness to talk to his Father. If Jesus Christ found it important to talk to his Father, then how much more important would it be for you and I? Am I where God wants me to be? Have I forgotten he loves me? Am I practicing prayer regularly? You know what? If you don't practice prayer regularly, you'll probably not end up where he wants you to be because you won't know. If you don't practice prayer regularly, you'll probably forget he loves you because you hadn't been talking to him. But you know what happens? If you're not where he wants you to be, a lot of times you won't pray because it's just like when, when you've done something you know you shouldn't, you didn't want to see mama come home, did you? See how these go hand in hand? Fourth question we need to ask ourselves is not only am I where he wants me to be, have I forgotten he loves me? Am I practicing prayer regularly, but very tightly and closely related to that, is am I being obedient to his word? Jesus says, come. There's two important, I think, there's a lot of important statements in this story. Two are very important. One of them was Jesus constrained them to get in the ship and go to the other side. He didn't constrain them to get in the other into the ship and die. Did you read that verse? Read the very first verse of the story. He constrained them to get into the ship and go to the other side. Not constrained them to get into the, in the ship and go halfway. That's not what he says. Get in the ship and go to the other side. That's their direction. And then here, when Peter says, Lord, if that's really you, uh, let me come to you. And he says, well, come on. Again, he didn't say come halfway and drown. He said, well, come on. You know, jump out of there, froggy, let's go. What happens? Peter gets halfway and he gets afraid. He didn't listen to the words of Christ. Christ has already told him once, go to the other side. Now he tells Peter, come to me. None of these disciples have listened completely to what the Word of God says. None of them have been completely obedient to the Word of God. You know the reason many times we don't end up where God wants us to be? It's because it's not that He didn't tell us we're like Jonah. Jonah, the problem wasn't the Word of God. The problem was Jonah's obedience. Jonah knew exactly where God wanted him to go. Jonah knew he was supposed to be in Nineveh. He knew. There was no question. We all know that. He chose to go to Tarshish. He ended up in the belly of the well. Why? Belly of the great fish. Why? Because he chose to be disobedient to God. Peter ends up sinking. Why? Because he chose to ignore the words of Christ. Christ told him, Come, come on over here. He chose to. We end up forgetting the love of God. Why? Because we don't listen to Him. Because if you listen to Him, you hear love. 
That's, all, that's what we hear from him. Listen, we, we have to ask ourselves, am I being obedient to his word? A, a disciple, a follower, someone modeling their life after Christ is going to be obedient to the Word of God. Not pick and choose, not buffet style. The Bible is not, you know, I, I've never seen the K&W version of the Bible. I've seen a lot of versions. There's a lot of them. There's not a K&W version where you go through and say, well, I'll take that and I'll take that and I'll take that. No. It comes cover to cover, the, the whole thing. Am I being obedient to the Word of God? Maybe that's the reason I'm in the mess I'm in. You know, I, I've, I've found a, a, a puzzle. I'm not going to bother you description. I've found a puzzle I, I like to work on. And, and um, i got a little app on my iPad that every day they send a new one, and I work on it. And, and it's a kind of a logic-based numeric puzzle. And, and um, every now and then, i, I got to explain to you, you, you're trying to follow numbers and make a pattern out of them. And every now and then I'll hit, it, hit a thing where, I, and it'll pop up red. And I'll get mad. No, that's right. You know, I'll just, man, I'll, I'll sit there and stare. I'll get mad. No, no, that ain't right. And I'll sit there and start counting. And I go, ah. I realize where I messed up now. It's one of these things where if you, you know, one, one of these kind of puzzles where if you mess up over here, it may not show up till over here somewhere. But, you know, I get to looking at it and trying to figure out why it said I was wrong. And I start tracking it back. And, oh, there it is. A lot of times, sometimes in our life, we way over here and the wheels blow off and we begin to realize that way back here, I, would, I wasn't obedient to the Word of God and it's finally come back to get me. I'm going to tell you something. Rest assured, when we are disobedient to the Word of God, it may not be immediate, but it will come back to bite us. It will. You cannot be disobedient to the will of God. That's like you hear people sometimes talking about breaking the law of gravity. No, you don't break the law of gravity. You prove the law of gravity. You jump off the steeple if you want to. You may break the law of gravity for about two seconds, but when it's all said and done, you prove the law of gravity. That's the way the Word of God is. You don't break the Word, you prove it. God says you be obedient and there'll be blessings. You disobey, there'll be cursing. That's what He says. Am I being obedient to the Word of God? And the final question that I, I think is important is when all this is said and done and they're all gathered back in the ship, I want you to notice what happens. When they get back in the ship and they go back, they come together and they worship Him. They worship Him. Am I remembering the value of worship? Am I remembering the value of worship? They come together and they worship him. And notice what they say. Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. When I say, are you valuing worship? I'm not talking about, are you taking the weekly bulletin or the newsletter and going, okay, we meet at this time and this time, and I'm going to those. Can I tell you something that maybe the person whose name is on the sign out front may not should tell you, may not be completely appropriate in some places, but I believe it to be the truth. If all the worship you get in a week is what's on the bulletin, you are worship malnourished. If that's all the worship you get is the few hours we gather, you're starving to death in the worship world. The truth of the matter is that on many times, on many occasions, perhaps even most occasions, the worship that you get, in, and I know I shouldn't say this, but the worship that you get in the church, quote, worship services is not of the quality of worship you get when it's just you and God. You ever sit on the, on the porch at the ocean in the mountains and watch the sun come up and just begin to commune with God? Maybe in your heart begin to sing, Oh Lord my God, how great thou art. 
and you just began to talk to them. Maybe you're riding, maybe it wasn't a beautiful scene of the sun shining over the mountaintops or coming up over the ocean. Maybe you're just riding down the road in the middle of a traffic jam and you begin to think. You begin to dwell on how good God's been to you, just you and Him. My mind went blank. Dale sings it. I can't think of the song. Um, Squire Parsons wrote it. Beulah Land. I've, I've told you before, Squire Parsons talks about how he came across that, how, how he wrote that song. He lives up in Asheville. And he said he was going up through the mountains, through those twisted roads, and he come around a curve. And, you know, sometimes when you come around some of those curves, you know, you look out up there, and it looks like you're just, you know, that there's no, you, you're fixing to drive off out into, in, into space out there. And he said he came around that curve, and he was just looking up into, into a beautiful blue sky. So I just felt like I was, could just drive my car right on into the presence of God. You know, listen, if all the worship we get is what we get here, you're hungry. Think about it. If you only ate as often as you are in church, most of us could buy some smaller clothes. A few of us would starve to death. Do we value worship? I want you to notice when all this was done, when the storm was calm, through the storm, they had been, they had been walking with Christ now for a while. They had seen Him perform some miracles. But at the end of the storm, they said, of a truth, you are the Son of God. The storm brought them to reality. Of a truth, you are the Son of God. I want to ask you to bow your heads this morning. Our musicians are going to come. How do you answer those questions this morning? How do you answer those questions? No one's looking around, it's just you. You're just thinking through those questions for a moment. Am I where God wants me to be? Can I ask you that question another way? When is the last time you know Beyond a shadow of a doubt, you were where God want you, wanted you to be. In your personal life, in your spiritual life, in your work life, am I where God wants me to be? Have I forgotten God loves me? Has Satan managed to creep up on your shoulder and whisper into your ear, God doesn't love you, God doesn't care about you? Have you begun to believe that? What's your prayer life? Am I practicing prayer regularly? Do I only pray when I'm in a storm? Do I only pray when I'm in a jam? Am I being obedient to God's Word? Am I valuing worship? Do I spend any time outside of church praying and talking to God and just telling Him I love Him? If you spent... No more time with your spouse than you spend with Jesus. What kind of relationship would you have with your spouse? How do you answer those questions? I need to come and kneel this morning and say, Lord, I need to know where you want me to be. I need to go. God, I need you to remind me in your gentle way that you love me. I've been going through some tough times. God, help me to pray. It's hard. It seems like I go to sleep. It seems like I never know what to say. But I want to be like the disciples. Teach me to pray. Help me to be obedient to your word. Help me to learn to take time during the week just to worship you, just to, just to, to let you know I love you. God, I want to be a disciple. I want to be a follower. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, You've never asked Him into your heart. You don't have a personal relationship with Him. You know that right now you're far, far away from God. You can feel it in your heart. You need to come this morning and let us show you. Let me show you from the Bible how you can have a personal relationship with Him. I'm not promising you'll never have a storm, that everything will be better. But I'm telling you that you'll have a relationship with Him, and one day you'll be able to spend eternity with Him. Do you know him? Father, this morning as we have our invitation,
God, I pray that your spirit would move in and out of these rows, out of these pews, speaking to our hearts. Lord, challenging believers, challenging Christians, those that are striving and trying to become a better disciple, follower, student of you. 